Viruses are the next group of organisms that we're going to discuss in this class. They are hugely important causes of infection, uh, and they end up being far more difficult to treat than bacterial infections. When we talk about a virus, what we're talking about is something that is filterable, very, very small. It is an obligate intracellular parasite meaning it must be inside of a host in order to replicate. It cannot make any energy or proteins independently of a host cell. So this right here is where we have a distinction between something like a virus and a bacteria like chlamydia, which is an obligate intracellular bacterium. The difference is that while chlamydia cannot make its own ATP, once it steals the host ATP, it has its own ribosomes to make its own proteins. Viruses do not. They cannot make their own ATP and they cannot make their own proteins. So that's what makes a virus different from something like chlamydia. A viral genome can be RNA or DNA and that RNA or DNA can be single or double-stranded, but there are no viruses that we know of that are both. Viruses can be naked or have an envelope, and again, that depends on the viral group. Generally, as far as I know of, there are no viruses that can exist as either naked or enveloped. The virus is naked or it's enveloped. It can't exist as both. Viral components are assembled. So viruses are assembled inside of the host cell and viruses do not replicate by division like a bacterial cell will do. So what are the consequences of all of those facts I just told you? Well, one of the consequences is that we do not consider viruses to be living. So viruses are not living. Viruses must be infectious to endure in nature. They cannot replicate on their own. They have to be able to get into a host cell in order to persist. Viruses must be able to use host cell processes to produce their components, their mRNA, their proteins, and copies of the genome. And again, that's what distinguishes a virus from an intracellular bacterium like chlamydia. Chlamydia can replicate its own DNA, it can make its own mRNA, and it can make its own proteins. It doesn't use host machinery to do that. It only uses host energy. If there is a process the virus needs that isn't provided by the host cell, the virus has to bring that along with it. And viral components must be able to self-assemble inside the host. So kind of as a summary, a virus is going to be some sort of nucleic acid plus structural pro proteins, plus or minus any other extra factors they wanna bring along with it. When you combine the nucleic acid with the structural proteins, that is called a nucleocapsid. And for our naked viruses, that's basically what they are. They are just the nucleic acid plus the structural proteins. For our enveloped viruses, they're going to have the nucleocapsid, so the nucleic acid plus the proteins, plus glycoproteins and a membrane. And that membrane is generally derived from host cells. That's what gives us an enveloped virus. Viruses are named and classified based on their structure, which can include size, morphology, and nucleic acids. Uh, their biochemical characteristics, so the structure and mode of replication, the diseases they cause, encephalitis and hepatitis, for example, means of transmission, arboviruses are spread by insects, host cell range, are they animal viruses, plant, bacteria, tissue or organ, and we call that tropism. So adenoviruses are named because they were first identified in adenoid cell tissue, enteroviruses generally infect the GI tract. So when we classify viral organisms, what we tend to see is there are DNA viruses, 
Some are enveloped, like pox viruses, herpes viruses, hepatoviruses. Some are naked, like papilloma, adeno, and some are single-stranded DNA viruses, like parvovirus. For the RNA viruses, um, we have single-stranded RNA viruses that are um, the positive sense strand, that basically this could serve directly as mRNA. Those could be naked or enveloped. We have negative sense strand RNA viruses. We're going to talk only about enveloped ones. We have double-stranded RNA viruses, and this one actually has a double capsid, which is pretty cool. And we have RNA-based based viruses that actually replicate via DNA, like the retroviruses. And so we'll talk about all of these, hmm, almost all of these groups as we progress through our viral section. When we have a single viral particle, we call that a virion. And with a naked one, remember we have um, the nucleic acids, RNA or DNA, and proteins. If the nucleocapsid is surrounded by an envelope, that is an envelope virus. For our naked viruses, the capsid on the outside, they, it's a protein capsid. And here's what's kind of important about comparing and contrasting naked versus enveloped viruses. Naked viruses tend to be very stable to the environment. They're stable to different temperatures, they're stable to acid treatment, they're stable to proteases, detergents, and drying. So it's harder to remove these from the environment. They also are released by the host cell um, through lysis. They cause the host cell to explode and die. The consequences, especially of the environmental stability, include they can spread easily on things like fomites from hand to hand, dust, small droplets. They can dry out and retain their infectivity. They can survive the adverse conditions of the gut. They can be resistant to detergents and poor sewage treatment. So there are a lot of benefits for a virus to be a naked virus. Now, in this case, because they are surrounded by protein, protein that is different from host is pretty easily recognized by antibody. So that may be sufficient for protection because antibodies can bind these naked viruses and prevent them from attaching to a host cell. With our enveloped virions, what we're seeing on the outside is a membrane. It's a phospholipid bilayer. So it contains lipids, proteins, and glycoproteins. The challenge for a virus that is enveloped is that it is environmentally labile. If you can disrupt the envelope, you get rid of the infectivity. If the envelope is compromised, the virus can't infect. So things like acid, detergents, drying, and heat are pretty good at disrupting envelope viruses. During replication of the virus, they modify the host cell membrane um, and then can be released by budding. So they can basically kind of push their way out of the host cell and grab a piece of the membrane and kind of wear it as a little coat to hide from the immune system. Um, but they can also uh, mediate cell lysis. It, it just depends. Now, the consequences for the virus, especially because of the um, lack of environmental stability, they have to stay wet. If they dry out, the membrane dries out, they lose their infectivity. These generally cannot survive the GI tract. The acid will destroy the membrane. These tend to be spread in large droplets, secretions, organ transplants, blood transfusions. They don't need to kill the cell to spread, especially if they can bud off. And in this case, because they can still spread without killing the host cell, it might be really important to have a cell mediated immune response to kill infected cells. These also will generally elicit a type of hypersensitivity and inflammation that causes immunopathogenesis because the host cell membrane is part of the envelope. Generally, the capsids um, 
will be repeated subunits and you get these sometimes really beautiful structures via electron microscopy. In the envelope virions, they sometimes have these glycoproteins that will act as what are called viral attachment proteins. It's how the virus will attach to the host cell. In general, when a virus uh, enters a host cell, the virus recognizes the host cell and attaches to a host cell protein. Inside the host cell, so you have a you have recognition, you have attachment, you have penetration. The virus is brought into the host cell, it penetrates in. And then you have um, uncoding, where the viral genetic material is released. Depending on the type of virus, where that genetic material goes uh, can be different. So we'll talk more about the specific viruses and where the nucleic acids go. Then uh, you'll have transcription of the genetic material and replication of the genetic material. Once you have transcription, you'll also have protein synthesis. Um, protein synthesis plus nucleic acid replication will allow for assembly and eventual release. So here they're showing you, if we follow the track at the bottom, you have replication of the genetic material, synthesis of the proteins, you have assembly into these are naked viruses that will cause cell lysis for release. Here, if we follow the arrow going towards the top, we have replication of the genetic material, production of proteins, grabbing of the host cell membrane to form an envelope, and then budding and release. Everything listed in pink here are types of ways that we have drugs to interfere with different steps of viral replication. But hopefully what you'll start to appreciate the more we talk about viruses is the fact that because viruses are using host cell machinery to do the majority of their replication, drugs that inhibit viral replication often inhibit host cell replication as well. And that can make it very, very difficult to treat these infections. In terms of viral replication, especially for our naked viruses, what we talk about a lot is um, burst size. So you might remember you see something like a bacterial growth curve where it's like low and then it gets high and then it flattens out and then it drops down where you kind of have constant detection of the virus. Generally what we see, uh, or I'm sorry, you have constant replication of the bacterium, right? Constant replication of the bacterium. With a virus, especially a naked virus, what we tend to see is that you actually don't have really much of a detectable amount of virus um, until a number of hours after viral entry to the cell. And then what happens is you get what's called a burst because the cell will burst. Um, and the burst size represents the number of different viral particles that are released from the cell. What's really interesting is the majority of viral particles that are synthesized inside of the host cell are actually defective. They replicate really quickly, so you can get errors in nucleic acid or protein synthesis that prevent a fully formed virus. However, when we talk about burst size, we are talking about the infectious particles produced per cell. That means like correctly assembled virions. And with different types of viruses, we see different burst sizes and different time courses. So retroviruses take a really long time. Retroviruses are gonna be things like HIV and the particles per cell is pretty low. Something like P coronaviruses, these are uh, often associated with colds or enteroviruses. Um, this can also include things like polio, short, incubation period and really high burst size. So again, you just have differences depending on the virus. In general, for recognition and attachment, you have viral attachment proteins, that's VAP, that will bind to receptors on the host cell. And what's really interesting for viruses is that some viruses are pretty limited in their host range. They can only infect certain types of organisms. And we'll talk about some viruses that can only infect one host. 
They also have tissue tropism. So just because a virus gets into the body or you are exposed to a virus doesn't mean the virus can cause an infection if it doesn't reach the right tissue. So host range are the organisms that can be infected. Tissue tropism represent the types of cells that can be infected. With a DNA-based virus, generally what we see is we have attachment, penetration, and uncoating, and the genetic material goes to the nucleus because that's where we as host cells synthesize DNA and do transcription of mRNA. So with most DNA viruses, and we will talk about an exception, but with most DNA viruses, um, we get replication and transcription that occur in the nucleus. And then just like with our cells, transcripts are exported to the cytoplasm for translation. So you get protein synthesis. Um, you get these proteins will then go back into the nucleus to help begin assembling the full viral particle, which will be exported as well as things are, they're exported. Um, they can then pick up an envelope or they can cause lysis or release of, of the virus. So DNA is pretty stable, so it's hard to, to destroy. One of the other things we see with DNA viruses is these often can establish um, a persistent infection. So one that lasts for a very long time, something like a herpes virus. They can also be immortalizing. They can cause cancer. DNA genomes reside in the nucleus. Pox viruses are a major uh, exception. The viral DNA resembles host DNA, so that's how you can use, if you're the virus, host machinery to do transcription and replication. Viral genes interact with host transcriptional machinery, again, except for the pox viruses, because remember, transcriptional machinery is going to be in the nucleus. Viral transcription is temporally regulated. So there's early genes. Those include DNA binding proteins and other enzymes. And then there are late genes that are transcribed later in the infection that encode structural and other proteins. So as the virus is getting ready to assemble and get out of the cell, that's when you'll start to see the late genes uh, being transcribed. DNA polymerases require a primer to replicate the viral genome. Our cells also require a primer to replicate our genome. And larger DNA viruses actually encode proteins that assist with the efficient replication of their own genome. 